Hey everybody, this is Dwight Peters from QuarterWaters.com, the site for social entrepreneurs. Where social entrepreneurs come in the program, they talk about the issue they're tackling, the impact they're making, and share helpful business tips along the way. If you are watching this program or listening to it, it's because you want to change the world through the power of business. You came to the right spot. Today on the program, we're going to find out how a social entrepreneur and his team is bringing education to children in the slums. This is a very serious issue. Today on the program, we have the founder of The Supply, Edo Kim. Enjoy the program. Hey, how's it going, Dwight? How's it going, all you uh, peeps out there? There we go. I'm excited, man. I even messed up on my own intro. I normally do it reverse, but anyway, only the viewers <laughs> will will understand that. But um, Edel, man, you know, I came across your organization, man, and I was blown away. You know, a lot of the entrepreneurs that I do interview on this program, um, they're in the for-profit market, but you're a nonprofit, and we're going to get into that. We're going to we're going to try sure, to figure out sure. why you went that route. But um, let's start off, man. What is the supply? All right. So the supply is a nonprofit organization, and uh, what we do is twofold. We build secondary schools for children in slums, um, and also what we do is we integrate a human rights slash service learning curriculum uh, in these schools, so that these children can really start to understand what their rights are. I got, let me unpack that a little bit. I mean, the whole definition of what a slum is, I think there's a lot of uh, misconception about what a slum actually is. I think even in American lingo, you know, or just in the way that we speak, we talk about slums and ghettos and, you know, and I think a lot of people have this idea that slums are just simply poor, you know, impoverished areas. Uh, but the thing is, slums are actually places that are urban areas where the government has completely neglected and they don't provide services for them. And so what you'll see is that there's trash piled up, there's no sanitation, no education, no health. And so a lot of these people are being denied their basic human rights. And if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights, yeah. all those things are in there. And so you're, you're basically faced with about 1.5 billion people today that live in these conditions. And what's, you know, for us, what are the, one of the most heartbreaking things is that these children are not going to be able to break out of this, you know, this cycle of poverty. I mean, their parents' generation a lot of them are illiterate. And so you're not, you know, the the leadership there is, is a little broken. And so what we're really trying to do is, A, really make sure that these children can have, you know, the tools uh, and are equipped to be the next leaders through education. But also, this education needs to be a little bit specialized. Instead of just, you know, building school after school after school, what's also important is that these kids have the proper tools. So human rights education and making sure that not only they're, that they have rights and they know their rights, but also that you know, with rights comes responsibility. And yes. so just because you have human rights, you can't infringe upon someone else's human rights. You have a responsibility and a social responsibility. And that's what we're trying to teach the kids out there as well. And so um, that's what the supply actually is. And if I can just really quickly t talk a little bit about why it's called the supply, it's really interesting. Yeah, man, we're going to jump into all of it, but go ahead. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Like the supply, I mean, the word of the supply is is really um, something that means a lot to me in the sense of when I first got to, to Kenya and I first met a student and he was in the classroom just sitting there while all the other kids had gone off to get lunch from their from their parents. And he was an orphan child. And basically I asked him, why, why are you not eating lunch? And he said, well, I have to sacrifice my lunch money that I that I earn selling corn every day just so that I can pay for tuition. Wow, man. And, you know, and then I asked him, okay, so why do you want to go to school so badly that you would give up lunch every single day? And his answer is really sort of the answer, is really the reason why we're called to supply is that he said, I want to use my education to come back to my community and help my community. You know, if I want to be a doctor because who else is going to take care of my, you know, my, my family and my people. And I think, we, in, in, especially in the United States, has this, have this idea that, you know, even with charity, it's we're the supply and these quote unquote poor folk are the demand right out yeah. in this world. But I think with education, it just sort of, you know, it's the, it really changes that a little bit in the sense of we supply education so that they don't just simply absorb it, but they in, in turn 
sort of become the supply to their communities. And it's not even just something that we are looking for, but it's in, it's built in into the fabric of those communities out there. And so it's already there. It exists. They just need the education framework to really sort of, uh, I guess, you know, act under. And so that's really why we call the supply is that supply doesn't meet demand. But in our case with education, supply meets supply and then, you know, meet supply, meet supply. And so it just a ripple it just effect. Going. Yeah. Um, for sure. Yeah. This is why I love what I do, man, because, um, you know, I don't, you could have jumped into any other field, man. You know, you didn't have to do this. You could have took that same entrepreneurial spirit and, I don't know, you could have started a tech startup. Or some of the other entrepreneurs on my program, they could have did something else, man. But they come and they create something that will have a long-lasting impression and truly change people's lives. Really install that. This is why I get excited. This is why I wake up every day, man, and try to reach out to you guys. I, 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 I love it. You know, this, this is what I really love, man. So let's find out now. How did you get to Kenya in the first place? Take Absolutely. Us back to the beginning. How did this all start? Right on. I mean, let me, if I can backtrack a little bit, I mean, I think a lot of times in the entrepreneurial space, um, we think of, you know, big companies like Groupon and, you know, Yelp and all these cool Twitter. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, yeah, I would agree that it kind of lands in your lap. But at the same time, these people have been really kind of strategizing and thinking about the next big idea. You know, uh, I think that is not as prevalent in the social entrepreneurship space as far as even in the nonprofit space. I think anyone who tries to strategize and really think of the big idea in some sense has their priorities in the wrong place. Um, you know, these are people maybe who have more of an ego who want to kind of put themselves before the issue. And so for them, they're like, oh, you know, I got to carve out my niche in this society and really, you know, be someone that's seen as someone that's innovative and thinking of a new idea for society. Yeah. And I think for me, I would, I'd like to say that this just kind of landed in my plate. I never wanted to start a nonprofit. I'd, I really felt like I didn't have the skill sets to run a nonprofit. I had never, you know, seen a slum in my life, actually. Um, and so really kind of everything happened with a purpose, in my opinion, though, because for me, um, I grew up in California, uh, middle class, and I went to Penn, and that's a, it's an Ivy League school. Yeah. But what's unique about that school, actually, is that right across the street on 40th Street, everyone tells you not to go across the street because it's one of the most you know, dangerous and broken areas and communities in, in Philadelphia. It's called West Philadelphia. Thing is, I was a little bit curious. And to be honest with you, I was kind of, you know, I like to have fun in college. And so they, they had these courses called ABCS courses, which were called academically based community service courses, where you could literally go and tutor kids or do service projects out in the community and you get course credit for it. And I was like, dude, this is the easiest <laughs> you know, way of getting you know, an A in yeah. a pen. And so I took so many of those courses. But what happened was that I st started to fall in love with this idea of service learning. Um, and so I went back to school at Columbia. Uh, to actually implement my own service learning program. And I did a master's there in education leadership. Um, and I was actually going to start a charter school with, with some classmates in the Bronx of New York. Thing is, during that whole process, you know, I, I, I thought about some other ideas. I even did a for-profit business for a while. And then pretty much I decided, you know what? During one of my classes at Columbia, the, the teacher, the professor said, don't listen to what I have to say. Go experience it. And so I took that challenge and I decided just to go to Kenya. Uh, you know, I had a friend out there who had connected me to a gentleman named Fanuel Aquaro, uh, who was running a school out there um, in, a, in the slums called Soweto. So he picked us up and then he started driving us all over Kenya, uh, Nairobi, and he started showing us all the different slums that exist out there. And I was like, whoa, this is way too overwhelming for me. But what happened was when we actually landed in one slum called Linana, which we had never heard of in our, you know, we met a man named Musk at Musiega who had been sponsored as a child all the way up to college. You know, someone had paid his tuition for him. What he decided to do was come back to Kenya, I mean, to come back to Lenana, and in that slum village, build the first ever primary school for these orphan children. And th this primary school is it's called a community school because it's not a government school, it's not a private school. It's sort of in between. 
Um, and it was such an inspirational story. And when I came back, that's when I decided, you know what? We have people like him, like Muscat, who is defending these children. I've been given so much. And I should be, I can and I'm, I'm willing to defend the children right alongside him. Um, and what he represented was the embodiment of what I really wanted to uh, I guess the idea of service learning that I had sort of started to develop and the love for that yeah. is that he was putting his money where his mouth was. You up. know, he was using his education as a call to action. And, you know, as I started racking up all these degrees, you know, from really prestigious universities, I had to challenge myself too is what is my purpose in of my education, right? And as the founder of the organization, it starts with me. If I can't represent something then this whole organization, you know, what what is sort of you know, the, the backstory behind what our organization represents? And it's really the idea that, you know, we have to really start understanding uh, what the purpose of our education is. And, I, you know, it's, it's sad, but at the same time inspiring that I got that from, you know, not only an orphan boy from Lenana, but also the director there. You know, they're the ones that taught me what it means uh, to, you know, what the purpose of my education is and why I decided to start the nonprofit, The Supply. Awesome, man. Now, now why, why Kenya? Was it because your professor mentioned Kenya? That's how you end up going to Kenya? Well, in a lot of our case studies, we learned about Kibera. And Kibera is probably one of the largest slums in the world. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a little bit more touristy now because everyone knows about it. And so even like all the celebrities... You know, Meta World Peace. I, Ron Artest, he he went there last <laughs> you year. You call the Meta World Peace. I'm I can't call him that. I'm sorry. He well, I'm I'm, a, I'm from Ron LA, Artest. so I'm a Laker fan, and so oh, I'm, I, I'm used to way, it now. Man. But but you know, it's it's one of those places where everyone goes to, um, and because we learned a lot about that slum, and I you know the statistic was alarming: seventy five percent of Nairobi urban dwellers, so people in that city, live in slums, and so that's like I don't know what city you're from. I'm from right the Bronx. Now. The Bronx, okay. So it's like imagine New York City, seventy five percent of the New York City, you know, living in slums. It's well, the it's South my... Bronx is pretty. You know, we we have issues over here, but trust me, I totally understand that. Right, for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, when you hear, hear facts like that, it's like, dude, that's I want to go check that out. And so, well, let me uh, let me turn off my phone real quick. Yeah, no problem, man. Apologize, and so no that's uh, that's kind of the reason why we we decided to go to Kenya, and you know now we've fallen in love with the community, and you know they fall in love with us, and it's just a great you know relationship that we have not only with the community but um, even with some of the local leaders there. Uh, it's been great, yeah. How long was your first trip there? Uh, first trip was only about a couple weeks actually, okay. and so it was really sort of this vision trip uh, that we we really had no expectation as far as what we were going to be looking for or what we wanted out of that trip. It was you know we could have easily said you know what there's nothing to do here, but really I think it was the stories of of Lenana of Muscat of the children that really captivated us, and that sort of really kind of start start got the ball rolling as far as the nonprofit process goes. All right, so All right. you go out there. What was your first step? What was your first move when you came back stateside? So the first step was really sort of doing a needs assessment as far as, you know what, is what's how many nonprofits are out there, right? Because yeah. if there are a lot of nonprofits, there's really not, you know, no need to clog up the space. Maybe it's just a matter of helping out another nonprofit and raising funds. And so, you know, kind of scoping out that and we realized, you know, through conversations with Muscat and some of the community leaders, there was no NGO. Uh, or a nonprofit that worked there. And in, in slums, uh, a lot of nonprofits back out of those areas because, you know, obviously nonprofits have to show results in order to get, you know, further funding and grants. Yeah. And with slums, because there's so many brick walls, it's, you know, you provide education, but these kids don't have clean water, you, you know, or they get sick. And so everywhere you go, there's a brick wall. You even provide, we're providing secondary school education, but some critics are saying, hey, so I guess they can't go to college, right? Because they can't afford it. You know, and so there's brick wall after brick wall. And so a lot of NGOs back out of these communities. But for us, we saw it as a challenge and we saw it as, hey, you know what? Just because there's, you know, because there's a big challenge doesn't mean that we can go in there. You know, and especially for us being young, I think really helped in the sense of, you know, we're going to strap our boots and, you know, we have nothing to lose. We don't have kids. 
Um, you know, we don't have families. We, we can do this. And so not in an irresponsible way, but in a very sort of, you know what, screw what, what everyone else is saying um, and how, all the fears that they have, we're going to go. Um, here's the one thing, though, is that when we the second time we did go there, we actually uh, were filming a documentary out there. All right. And uh, what happened was basically we had filmed late into the night. And this is a lesson that we learned very quickly is, is just cultural awareness and just sort of being aware of your surroundings. And what happened was that night we filmed late into the night. We were waiting for a bus. And actually three gentlemen um, pretty much attacked us with machetes and pistols. And it was probably one of the scariest things that I had ever, I guess, encountered. Yeah. And it really sort of brought us to a point where we said, is this – is this something that, you know, should really set us back in the sense of maybe we shouldn't be there? And we were really discouraged, actually. Um, but within a month, actually, um, we were getting, after we told our story, we, we were getting fun, like funds left and right. And people were saying, no, we want you to go back. Um, and that kind of was sort of our, in some ways, calling to go back to Kenya um, even despite all those challenges that we had to face just being out there and being attacked and risking our lives in some sense. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, obviously for uh, for me being not a Kenyan myself, um, you know, they call it literally when we got there, it was funny because they were coming with like piece, pieces of paper and they're saying, oh my gosh, it's Jackie Chan. <laughs> and they really thought it was Jackie Chan, you know, and they were wanting my signature yeah. and, you know, it's just, but now when we go, it's like, you know, well, you these signed guys. a couple of them, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I gave them a, a little email address too. I said, "Email me for uh, you know." You uh, uh, but you know, it, it's it's really those are the things, lessons that you learn as you go through this process. But go, kind of going back to what what happened then is we incorporated as a nonprofit and we just started to do grassroots fundraising. And our first campaign was called, you know, "Supply the Supply." And it was sort of a way of saying, hey, we really need to start our nonprofit. And so we put a target of $15,000 and just arbitrary number. Um, and we raised $15,000. And that was sort of the thing that launched us forward. Um, and so we've been we've been tremendously blessed in the sense of, you know, most young nonprofits struggle a lot. Yeah. I mean, for us, we we definitely obviously started with our friends and family, but that really sort of. You know, all these things that happened, even the, the the kind of the challenging things that happened with the attack kind of, you know, really became a all blessing a more than a, you know, a disadvantage in some sense, too, because we were able to come back and tell the story and also just share with people that, hey, you know, the, these are sort of also the reasons why education is so necessary in, in areas like this, you know, and um, it's it's really been it's really been a blur now. I mean, it's all, it's all, it's, this is our third year now, but you know, it seems like yesterday that we started this, right? So. Awesome, man. And I think this is a perfect segue to my next question. Um, you know, I always have this debate with social entrepreneurs for profit, nonprofit, mm -hmm. which one was this a conscious decision to create a nonprofit or was this something that was debated in the beginning? Did you ever consider the for profit model? Well, I mean, we we did consider the for-profit model, and there's you know a lot of advantages for the for-profit model. But I, I would say that advantage really comes into play in the sense of you know accountability. You know, if if it fails, then everyone's held accountable. And in the nonprofit space, I think what happens is a lot of nonprofits open up, and you know they don't show results, but they keep going, and they they're you know, um, ir it's irresponsible in some sense. For us, though, as far as the reason why we decided to go nonprofit over for profit, it was a very conscious decision. Um, there's there's a couple layers to it. I mean, for there's one layer in the sense of there's not a lot of culturally. Um, let me, and I'm, I'm going to tie this into a bigger point. But culturally, I'm I'm an Asian American, and what we find is that there's not a lot of Asian American leaders in the nonprofit sector, especially in international development. Um, you know, we're kind of, I, I'm generalizing here, but we're bred in, in, in this kind of, you know, family dynamic as to, uh, you know, your education is to really go and go, go become a doctor, go become a businessman, go become, you know, a lawyer. And even with the mentality of 
I guess, sort of social giving and philanthropy and nonprofits. The attitude is generally make all the money first and then build and then make a nonprofit or, you know, build your empire and then give half of that empire away. Yeah. That's a very sort of cultural way of thinking about nonprofits. And for me, I kind of wanted I'm always sort of fighting the status quo. And I thought we can make a bigger, you know, we can make more, quote unquote, social change by even sort of standing up for even that big cultural barrier that we're trying to break. And, you know, we've in some sense on a very sort of a, resi a residual effect of our work has been inspiring all these, you know, young, I mean, young people in general, but even young Asian Americans who who are starting to see, wow, you know what, like th these these guys are doing it. They're putting their money where their mouth is. Too. And nonprofit, yeah, the, the glamour of not being paid of obviously like you know, rewards as far as bonuses or even possibility of IPOs, that doesn't exist and making millions will never be the case. But, you know, as far as, so for me, it was a very personal decision to, to go the nonprofit route. Uh, I don't have any, you know, I'm not as critical as a lot of other people as far as, you know, for-profit models that are doing social good as well, because in a lot of ways, you know, that's very, very sort of a trend that's I think showing a lot more impact, um, but that's because I think more so the, the management is a lot more sort of you get a lot more qualified guys uh, that you know, obviously the money will money will talk. And so, yeah. um, but I will say that the nonprofit world and the for profit world has to come together and yeah. do a lot of collaborative learning together um, just because, you know, nonprofits can learn a lot from for profit models and for profit models obviously can learn a lot from, you know, uh, nonprofit models as well. And for, for me personally, um, research and, you know, all really understanding the issue is, is probably one of the most important aspects of our work, um, uh, because, you know, we want to show results. And one of our core values is if we don't show results, um, then we're pointless. There's no reason why we should be here. Um, and so in that sense too, I think, um, you know, a nonprofit model fit our sort of what we were looking for uh, much better. Awesome. You know, I appreciate for-profit, non-profit, uh, you know, and I had to take a step back when I started this program. I noticed that I was just in a habit of, um, you know, I was so excited about for-profits, you know, being socially aware, being socially responsible. Like, this is stuff that I expect from nonprofits. Sure. But when I found out that for profits were doing that, somebody found a way to crack the code and create a for profit to do it. I was blown away. And I had to take a step back and look at, you know, the amount of people that I interviewed so far for profit and nonprofit. And I noticed that I, it was very disproportionate. So, you know, I'm trying to get more for profit founders on, the, I mean, nonprofit founders on the program as well because, um, you know, at the end of the day, our goal is actually all the same, man, which is to create a long lasting impact. So we talked about the issue and we talked about, you know, how important education is and especially providing it to help, you know, your, the recipients supply their own community. If I can absolutely supply, uh, let's talk about the impact. How do you gauge impact? What metrics do you guys use? You've been you've been going for three years, roughly. What are the metrics? Sure. So, I mean, for us, um, obviously, you know, the basic metrics would be, you know, are these are these schools actually increasing the access to education? And so obviously in the education space, it's always going to be the debate between access and quality. And so for us, uh, we just make sure that these schools are filled to capacity and that the children that need it most have access. Um, as far as the quality control goes, we're not necessarily operating the school. And so what we do is we, we work with primary schools that are already in existence and we build a secondary school on top of that. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But in slums, especially land tenancy issues are one of the biggest issues where, uh, you know, getting slum lords, I guess you can call it slum landlords. They're very shady when it comes to like, you know, who owns the land, you know, because this land is sort of unauthorized land, who owns it? And so for us to build on top of that is, you know, it's it's tricky. So what we do is we just literally build on top of land that's already been given to a primary school and we build a secondary school to that. And so um, what Wait happens is that my, board my, that I should, I'm sorry to jump in. I should, I should have asked this question from before. So these secondary schools, how do kids get enrolled in them? And first off, are they paying tuition? Are you guys able to provide free education? How do they so, get in? 
Right. So that's a good question. So in Kenya and Nairobi and, and a lot of other slums as well, there's three types of schools. There's government schools that the government should be providing. And especially with all the, the you know, UN, you know, push for education for all EFA and also sort of the Millennium Development Goals, where it's universal primary education. There's a lot of push for governments to and pressure for governments to provide free education for students. Uh, the only problem is that, you know, just like public schools here in the U.S., but just magnified times 100, yeah. the quality is is poor. I mean, there's so many kids in a the classroom. There's sometimes 75 to 100. Wow. You find teachers that are literally sleeping on the job. Uh, and so the al- other alternative is private schools. But private schools are obviously way too expensive. Uh, and so there's a middle section, middle ground where it's a community school. And community schools are basically low-cost private schools. And so what they do is... Children still pay tuition, um, and that tuition goes to paying the teachers and the operations of the school. Tuition is generally about $50 for a term, and a term is about three to four months. And so it's relatively cheap compared to all the other alternatives. And so for us, I mean, our secondary school, yes, um, children do pay. Again, it's nothing that we operate. And so the, the board of the primary school that we build the secondary schools for uh, they're the ones that that recruit the teachers, you know, pay their teachers, and they they fully function. And what's beautiful about that is that it becomes a very sustainable uh, sort of project because you know it's bringing revenue into the school yeah. um, that they can either d- allocate it to the primary school and the secondary school. Um, a lot of times, these structures become income generators for you know because they rent it out to churches, to community meetings. And, you know, these facilities act as more than just schools. And and so, um, you know, and a lot of people ask us, why why build a structure? And I think there's a lot of criticism more and more, especially with Greg Mortensen's book that, you know, got exposed and all these schools that no longer act, you know, as schools and they just become, you know, uh, I guess, locations for, you know, farming tools and things like that. School, obviously, education can happen outside of school. I'm not saying that schooling is just limited to four walls. But at the same time, in slums, these children need a place of security. They need to be be in a place where they can socially interact with friends. Um, They need to, you know, they come from very broken families and and sort of places of abuse. And, you know, right outside the four walls, actually, you'll see a, a patch of field where you'll have all the idlers, all the adults who don't have a job just getting drunk because beer is so cheap there. And so in some ways, the four walls become very symbolic of, you know, of safety and of, you know, of, of children's, I guess, you know, comfort and, and a place of hope, I guess. And yeah, you're blocking out the outside world, which is potentially dangerous. And, you know, you're creating a community within those four walls to create change. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's sort of our rationale behind, you know, why we actually put up structures. Um, reason why it's, you know, each school build is about $50,000. And some people might say, hey, you know, some other organizations, they build schools for $25,000. And our sort of response to that is in slums, again, in our context, because of the land tenancy issues, the city still owns all of the land. So Nairobi still owns all the land. And so you still have to go through all the proper certifications and the ordinances. And, you know, you have to get, you know, you can't use local labor. You have to get contractors, professional architects, uh, because at the end of the day, if, if a school structure breaks down in any other organization, if it breaks down, no one's really responsible except the community that built it. Um, you know, and they usually work in rural areas where there is no sort of right to land. For us, though, we make sure that our schools are very safe, they're real, structurally well built, and that you know they, they can last a long time. And so that's why our builds cost around fifty thousand um, dollars. And so, um, I, I I forget what the original question was, but no, I was asking you um, what was the how how, do, how were kids accepted into the school? Was it by tuition base? But this leads to another question. So, how many schools have you guys been able to build so far? So we've so again. So our first year was really research and and development. As far as we wanted to make sure, and this is a very important part of our process. We wanted to make sure that you know Nairobi was not only a good fit for us, but yeah. also that we were a good fit for them. And so we literally had so many conversations, so much planning with the community leaders and families to make sure, A, that they wanted a secondary school and B, that, you know, that they would really want to work together with us in making sure that, you know, 
because our human rights education curriculum requires the whole community to be involved. If they see children out there, and one of our most recent projects was a trash pickup day where, you know, volunteerism doesn't exist in communities like that because they're so broken that they're like, hey, you know, people should come help us. Why should we go help our community? Um, you know, is that we need families to be just as invested in it so that when they when these children come home, you know, they're not like, you know, castigated for or, you know, for taking part in sort of these kind of activities, but, you know, that they really embrace this idea of service and volunteerism. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that our work was appropriate for those for those areas. And we wanted to get as much information data as far as slums go, because a lot of times these slums don't have data, uh, census data, because cities just want to, refu they refuse to acknowledge them as people. And so we try to collect as much data as possible. So we've, we're completing once uh, our first secondary school in May, okay. and we have three more builds that are going to be completed in December of 2000, this year. And so we have four builds that are going to be done by December of 2012. Um, and like I said, it's not about quantity for us. You know, we're not, our mission is not about, you know, um, building a hundred schools or, or anything like that. Our mission is if we can get two or three great leaders to come out of our program, of our, out of our schools, that can transform a community. That's our, our, that's our belief. And so if we can really invest in, in communities, um, that's more important than, you know, investing in thousands of communities where our work may not be as fruitful. And not um, definitely, definitely agree. Uh, all right. So, what are the tactics that you guys do use to raise money? How, how do you guys uh, go about raising money for your cause? Absolutely. I mean, we have last year, it was completely grassroots efforts. Um, you know, we did different campaigns where, you know, just like, I mean, we use a lot of sort of best practices from other organizations, right? So Charity Water, I mean, they're sort of the... the, the yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, they're awesome. We don't have to say nothing. We just smile. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, like their birthday campaigns is something that we've really wanted to emulate. Uh, we've done different, you know, campaigns such as our, our a very successful campaign that we did was called Lunch for Lenana, where I told you the story of the kid who gave up lunch. We said, you know what, if he's giving up lunch, why don't we have all of our, you know, why don't we have all of us give up our lunches too and donate the lunch money that we would have used for, for lunch to this or to our organization and so we raised fifteen thousand dollars through that you know we've we've raised money through our chapter system we have about 10 to fit we have about 10 to, i don't know the exact number 10 to 15 global chapters who oh, each so. raise about a thousand dollars you know these are high school college kids who raise about a thousand dollars every year you know it's and i mean one of the big things that we did last year was we use social media and i'm kind of a I guess I'm an old soul in the sense of I wasn't really in tune with the the power of YouTube and Twitter, uh, but we have a you know we connected with one of the more most popular YouTubers out there in in today's YouTube world, and he gets about two to three million views, you know each video. And basically, what we did was we challenged his name is Kev Jumba, uh, and we challenged him to come out to Kenya and. You know, it, it was one of those like random sort of he responded back and said, you know what, I'm going to take up the challenge. And so he flew out to Kenya, got really invested in our children and our cause. And now he's sort of an ambassador for organization. And, awesome. you know, this year he's he's committed X amount of funds to, you know, we've named the first school after him. It's going to be called Jumba Linana Academy. There's just a really a lot of cool things now that we're realizing that we can do in, in really enhancing our fundraising. And this year. You know, through those efforts, now we're able to kind of highlight those and bring it up to, you know, grantees and people who give grants, bigger grants down and say, hey, look at all the work we've done. Um, and, you know, they obviously can provide a lot of bigger funding that we're going to be um, using for our, our, our projects this year. What would you have told yourself three years ago? Now knowing what you know now, in the beginning, what, what advice would you have given to yourself? So I always say that um, we we got we let the carriage ahead of the horse, and I, I let the carriage ahead of the horse in the sense of things picked up way too fast, and I I should have harnessed it, and without knowing your mission and having that concrete and you know because with education for example, you know initially we started with oh we're going to provide education for the uh, the children in developing countries, again it's it's great it's a great mission. But, you know, 
how can you make that more specific, mm, right? Can okay. you be more regionally focused? Can you be more sort of demographically focused? You know, as you spread that out, you think, oh, it's going to attract more people to your cause. But that's a, that's really not the case. I think what I, I really want should have done is really, really set the mission statement concretely in place first and then just started to do work. Because in a lot of time, in a lot of ways, not that we wasted time, but we could have created much more deeper impact, you know, um, instead of sort of kind of dabbling for the first two to three months, you know, and just because we thought we were an established nonprofit, we started doing all this fundraising and fundraising was great. But I think what happens is that you know, a lot of people get a mixed message about what you, what your nonprofit's about, okay. you know. And if you don't know exactly how to communicate your mission statement, even when you do, when you propose like elevator pitches or business competitions or, you know, go to grant meetings, if you can't communicate your mission statement, you're done. That, that's it. And so I would say for any aspiring sort of social entrepreneur or, you know, nonprofit leader, it's make sure you not only know your mission statement you know, like back of your hand but you can communicate it and also you believe in it wholeheartedly and in some ways right your organization should live and breathe that mission statement so you know i mean it, it should really reflect in all of your core values and who you are as individuals um and so i would really say the mission statement and just kind of making sure organizationally we were we were ready to tackle all the the new sort of attention that we were getting uh, so quickly. So, you know, I, I man, I, I just love it. I want to take a trip out to Kenya now just to see this, you know. But um, what are some of the challenges that you guys are currently facing? So a lot of the challenge that we face right now is, and this is maybe a little bit too high level, but in, in some sense, you know, what we didn't realize was how much of an impact that it could have on sort of young people, right? I mean, for, for me, when I started, I'm sort of a geeky guy. Um, and so for me, it was a lot of academic research. I really wanted to see, you know, kind of you know, investigating kind of, you know, what are what are all the, the, the research and the policies that are out there in regards to, and so I can rattle off anything in regards to the UN, you know, the Human Rights Declaration. But at the same time, you know, as, as important as that is, what we realize also is that, you know, wow, like these kids and these young, this young population, I guess they're not as exposed. You know, I kind of foolishly thought that they knew everything that I knew. Right. Yeah. But in some sense, they don't. Right. I mean, a lot of these kids have never even heard about international development. Yeah. A lot of these you know children have never even heard about social entrepreneurship. And so in a lot of ways, trying to balance both of those right in our work, because we can really just decide, okay, you know what, we're, we're just going to take grant funding from a lot of these bigger donors and do our work. And we don't need a grassroots movement, right? At the same time, you know, it's exciting to see a young, you know, it's exciting to get, you know, right now we have, I think, 6,000 something, you know, Facebook followers and, you know, people tweet about us and, you know, seeing young people start understanding what slum is and, you know, really seeing how education can impact slums. That's also part of social change that I'm, I'm realizing is just as important as the work we're doing out there in some sense. And so I think for us, whether we, we, you know, in our budget, in our planning, in our strategy, it's really kind of balancing both and really being able to communicate, you know, much to, to a more mature audience, really sort of our objectives our you know, our outcomes, all the metrics that a lot of mature, the mature audience, you know, wants to hear about. And at the same time for the younger audience, it's really sort of, you know, giving them something digestible, giving yeah. them something that they can understand so that they can really, you know, do something about uh, our cause and really kind of, you know, be a part of our cause as well. And so I would say that's a big challenge. Um, and secondly is, you know, the, the problem is so big and in a lot of ways is, you know, it's in a very sort of we're greedy, we're selfish in a lot of ways, too. And we want to do everything. Right. We want to tackle health. We want to tackle education. We want to, you know, we see the slum problem. We see that there's 10 problems that we need to be fixed. And so for us, it, it pains us when, you know, even though there's so much work just to be done in education, it pains us to see, you know, oh, man, like we, we really should be working on malaria as well. Um, 
but to be able to kind of step back from that and really dedicate a lot of your you know your focus and attention to one thing is also a, a very big challenge especially for you know type a personalities where yeah. we're, we're trying to we're trying to do everything right and we're really trying to kind of control things and i think you have to really be able to let go you really know, depend on partnerships and collaborations um to really you know you know, it's the beauty, the, the beauty that I find in it, and trust me, I feel the same way, man. Like, I look at the world, and there's 20 issues I want to tackle. Yeah. But um, you can't do it by yourself, and that's the beauty of it, that you don't have to do it by yourself. Right. And that's one of the reasons, like, when we talked earlier, why I started this site is so that social entrepreneurs that are watching this program or people that don't even know that they are social entrepreneurs can become inspired by hearing your story and say, you know what, I'm going to tackle this issue. So if more of us start to become aware and, and actually become social entrepreneurs before you know it, we'll, we'll have a strong community within ourselves. Oh, absolutely. Of people for branching sure. out, tackling issues and creating partnerships. So, you know, no, never feel that way, man. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You found your part. You're doing your job. It's on us, the rest of the world, for us to find our part. And, uh, like you said, put our money where our mouth is, step up to it. So never feel like that, man. I used to feel like that too. Who knows? Maybe quarter waters is my part. Just, you know, bringing the story out to other people. For sure. Who I knows, mean, man? who knows my, who might be watching this and then we'll get an email right after and say, hey, dude, you know. And so that would be an amazing just testament to what the impact that you can have just through this program for sure. Definitely, man. You know, the world is changing, especially – you could feel it in the air, and I like to touch on the Occupy Wall Street movement so much. You see so many young people are are just disgusted with the way our, you know, businesses have acted, the way our, you know, politics have acted. And um, there, there's really – I notice one thing. With everybody that I interview, a large percentage of people, a lot of the social entrepreneurs were activists, whether they knew it or not. You know, they got upset about an idea or they, they – they felt some emotional attachment to an idea and instead of sitting on their asses they got up they became mm. active man and that's the beauty of what we're doing here i don't you know man i don't want to leave anything out you know I, I try to get as much as i possibly can out of this stuff Do you, what what are we leaving out i know there's something that we're leaving out well i mean you know for me i'm very sort of uh i do want to just really share a little bit about sort of, you know, especially anyone that's out there that's in the, in the, in the boat of, Hey, I really want to do something. Yeah. Um, uh, what can I do? Um, whether it's for our organization or whether it's starting their own, own thing is, um, I, I really believe that, you know, kind of touching on the whole idea of partnerships and collaborations is that, you know, we can't be selfish in this space. Like we can't just decide, man, I you know, everyone wants to be known as the guy who who started Charity Water. Everyone wants to be the guy, you know, the founder of the newest innovative technology out there. Yeah. And, you know, it that's an ego thing. And that's kind of what I how I first started off this conversation is that we need to drop our egos, you know. And, you know, for, for me, like I have all the reason, I'll be honest, I have all the reason to have the biggest ego. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going to be done with a degree at Harvard and, you know, like all the people here basically feed me this ego and say hey you're you know you're the best you're you're awesome and you know that's it's not it's not it why why has nonprofit and why has social entrepreneurship become about us all of a sudden when it's about when there's so many problems and complex challenges that we have to tackle and it's a, it's about the people that we serve yeah man and i'm deeply passionate about you know really changing you know, that that sort of space. I, I That's why sometimes even the idea of social and entrepreneurship, sometimes those two words going together sometimes really doesn't really fit fit well with me and sit well with me in the sense of, you know, when I think of entrepreneurship, I think of, oh, the best, the next big idea. And that's too much placing too much emphasis on the self and the individual rather than um, social good. And, you know, making sure that we're responsible with what we do as well, because I, you know, there's a there's a text from Henry David Thoreau's Walden Pond where, you know, all these people are trying to do such good things. But intention doesn't necessarily lead to, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, actual good destination, things. you know, what I mean, you might cause more damage in, in, in really thinking of the next big idea. And, you know, for me, I, I truly believe that direction 
leads to destination. I mean, one story that someone told me was, you know, you can you can want to go to uh, Disney World. Your intention is, oh man, I'm going to go to Disney World. But you start driving up to Canada, you'll never get there. You know, <laughs> so your intention is not going to lead to direction. It's, I mean, destination. It's you literally have to start driving down to Florida in order to get to Disney World. And that direction and really kind of doing it. Um, and really putting your mind not to yourself, but to the goal and to the objective will really get you where you need to go. And so, you know, um, I hope, you know, I mean, I'm a 28 year old who technically, yeah, you're right, has so much potential to be in the for profit space, has so much, you know, um, so much demand in this quote unquote society. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I really, really think that education you know, there, I can't, I can't wake up, you know, um, not thinking about the complex problem. And I truly, the slum problem is the most complex problem to me right now. Like I, it racks my brain. Like every day it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't think about this. And what a beautiful thing it is actually to wake up and to know that, wow, I'm using all this knowledge and education that I was so blessed to get to really start thinking about you know, how I can really go about solving this complex problem, you know, and the nonprofit and the whole social entrepreneur thing that just comes along for the ride. You know, that just kind of, that's just a title in some sense uh, and a framework for how I, how I can work. But at the end of the day, my heart is just about making sure that we can really make a difference in an outcome. um, And I can, you know, leave this world, I guess, knowing that, you know, Peter, John, Ruth, these are the people, these are some of the names of the kids that we, we meet, that they're the ones that are now in my shoes having an interview with you when they're 28. And they're talking to you on, you know, um, on this program and saying, yo, Dwight, you know, like, I got an education and now I'm doing this. I'm really trying to transform Nairobi. And I mean, how amazing would that be? And that's, that's really what we're about. That's what it all comes down to, man. For sure, man. And I'm sure for you, too, I'm sure there was someone there that really inspired you, um, you know, to do what you're doing and to asp- and, you know, what you aspire to do. You know, there, there are people out there that have sort of passed the baton onto our generation. Definitely. Uh, yeah. And we got we got to run with it, you know. Um, and just one thing I would say, and that last thing is just with the nonprofit space is, um, you know, it's. There's so many people who want to tell you what to do. And so religious groups, political groups, you know, even if a big time celebrity comes on board and gives you a check for a million dollars and says, hey, like, this is what I want you guys to do. You have to stay firm to your core core values, um, you know, and, and that's something that, you know, I think nonprofits don't necessarily have are so accountable for yeah. for profits in some ways have more accountability in, in terms of that kind of stuff and the regulations and all that stuff. But I would say just in the same thing is that you can't let anyone dictate how your organization is run, especially, you know, I, I'm talking to all the leaders out there and the people who, you know, who want to run this thing is that especially because I'm young, a lot of people really try to push the envelope and really try to try to tweak it. And but just trying to that's another big challenge is trying to stay firm to what you believe and what you think is right for the organization to believe. Um, is is critical, and you know not only for the short run but for the long run in making sure that you guys are you know transparent, accountable, and you integrity. I mean, I can't speak enough about integrity, but I can probably talk thirty minutes about integrity, so I'm going to stop there. But um, very important stuff for for nonprofits. Nah, definitely, man. That's what leadership brings, man. You have to stick firm to the initial idea, to the initial vision. And, you know, you're going to be swayed at times, man. People, well, people are going to try to sway you at times. And, you know, they might have the best intent in the world, like you said, you know, but it is about direction. So, Edo, keep up the great work, man, with what you're doing with the supply. The organization is doing great things. I look forward to having you guys back on the program in the near future to talk about some more of the, you know, opportunities you guys are providing to the kids out there, man. Keep up the great work, man. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dwight. I mean, for sure, you guys are doing some amazing things, too. And so we'll definitely be connected and, uh, you know, we'll just uh, continue to dialogue. I mean, dialogue and communication also is something that really, really sparks change, too. And so hopefully, you know, I 
think you have some really great ideas too. And so we'd love to just talk off the record, I guess, um, even about different ways that, you know, um, we can really do this thing together for sure. Got it.